The Netflix movie Troll is something of a first, namely a Norwegian kaiju movie. It takes cues from both the original Godzilla and King Kong, but with a uniquely Norwegian take featuring a troll from Nordic folklore. Since I just so happen to be Norwegian, I have repeatedly been asked to comment on the movie, how accurate it is to the folklore, and to take a deep dive into that folklore. Like, were there ever any real trolls roaming the Nordic countryside? If not, what were they based on? What does the word troll even mean? Watch till the end, and you will know the answer to all of these questions. In this video then, I will begin with a very quick review and point out the obvious on-screen references that any Norwegian will spot, but which may elude everyone else. Then, using the movie as a starting point, we'll be going on a deep dive, exploring the folklore, its meaning, and most importantly, its origins. The movie itself is an entertaining, well-acted feature with incredible special effects. Like the very best of kaiju movies, it has themes of authority and efficiency, but first and foremost, conservation. Now, in this divided day and age, that may be off-putting to some, but this movie even makes a point of throwing Greta herself under the bus. How dare you! So the message here is a common-sense, non-partisan and non-radical one that everyone can get behind. As a standalone movie, it has its flaws. I can only imagine that real-life paleontologists would have some issues with how the lead conducts herself at a dig site. And you can tell the movie was developed before Netflix learned their lesson, and all Netflix productions were required to go deep in girl power territory, a requirement which the director only paid superficial lip service to. Overall though, a fun time. While there is no shared continuity going on, the movie can be regarded as a spiritual successor to an earlier Norwegian movie dealing with trolls, namely 2009's Troll Hunter. So Norway is two for two when it comes to troll movies, check them both out. The screen story is kicked off with a tunnel being blasted through Dovrefjell, the Dovre mountain. But this wakes up a huge troll, which emerges from the mountain. There is some significance to this, and while not knowing what will not diminish your enjoyment of the movie, some basic insight will greatly enhance your viewing experience. If there is one mountain that is sacred in Norway, it is Dovre Mountain. A common pledge of allegiance in Norway, one which is used both in casual conversation as well as by our founding fathers who wrote the Norwegian constitution, it is to be true until Dovre falls. Meaning forever, because that'll never happen. Also, do you know this piece of classical music? The English title of that piece is Hall of the Mountain King, and it was composed by Edvard Grieg for Henrik Ibsen's 1876 play Per Gynt. But the English title is not a literal translation of the original Norwegian title, I Dovre Gubbens Hall. A more accurate translation would be In the Hall of the Troll of Dovre Mountain, because the piece is very specifically about the troll king residing inside of Dovre Mountain so you can see how that informed the movie. Secondly, and this is what I am asked about the most, all of the locations in the movie are real, and that includes the theme park featuring a prominent troll statue. This would be Hunderfossen Adventure Park, and the design of the troll here, as well as the one featured in this movie, and those in the earlier movie Troll Hunter for that matter, are all inspired by the 19th century illustrations of Theodor Kittelsen, and of his many troll illustrations, this one of a troll walking up the Oslo High Street towards the Royal Palace is prominently featured in the movie. All Norwegians are familiar with these illustrations, because they have always accompanied the books of Asbjørnsen and Mu, the 19th century folklorists who traveled the Norwegian countryside and preserved the folk tales for future generations. 
All Norwegians grew up with the stories they collected and the tropes in them. Like that trolls can smell the blood of Christians, so Christians in particular need to be on the lookout for trolls. Also, however big the trolls may be, they are a bit stupid and can be defeated by wit. Now, there is a folklorist in the movie too, and he maintains that these stories that all Norwegians grew up with deliberately misrepresented what the trolls actually were. While the movie went a different direction with it, there is merit to this basic notion. So what is the truth behind trolls? What is their origin? And why should Christians in particular be so worried about them? To uncover what is really behind the folktales, we have to go on a scholarly deep dive, which is beyond my level of expertise. For that, we need a genuine folklorist, and I just so happen to know one. So with that, I pass the baton to my friend, fellow Norwegian and expert in pre-Christian Nordic society and mythology, Tord from the YouTube channel Norse Magic and Beliefs. Thank you, Andre, and welcome all I've been invited to speak on this great channel um, to give a more detailed uh, breakdown on the trolls in the folklore and the mythology and its origin. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed the movie, and I hope you'll enjoy this uh, quick little history lesson uh, about trolls, because there really is some interesting historical things in here that even most Scandinavians and historians don't even know. So. What a troll is, and the word troll, has actually been very different throughout the ages. Um, and to get the main idea, we kind of have to break it up into three time periods. Trolls before Scandinavia became Christian, trolls after Scandinavia became Christian, and trolls during the time period when Scandinavia was becoming Christian. In the mainstream history books, uh, you will read that this period was right around the year 1000, uh, but the reality is the process of Christianization took place over hundreds of years, and it took a long time to fully Christianized, and I'll explain all of that in just a minute, uh, but first we can speak about the etymology and original meaning of uh, trill. It comes from the Old Norse word uh, trill, um, and it's often simply translated to mean things like giant being, or not of the human race, evil spirit, or a monster. But this is definitely not a complete understanding of what it means. Uh, if we look at an older version of the word, uh, we think that it comes from the Proto-Germanic uh, Truslan, which is a little bit older than Old Norse by a few hundred years. And uh, that means sing in a full rolling voice, or perhaps walking slow and clumsily, or to lumber, those kinds of things like this that you see up on the screen. So, okay, now we're getting a bit closer. A deep, rumbling voice, or a creature who walks slow and clumsily. Okay, yeah, we can definitely see how that word could relate to our more modern conception of trolls in the folklore. Then uh, that's from more than a thousand years uh, later. But the earliest mentions of trolls in the oldest text that we have, um, those go back to the sources written a little bit after the Viking Age, but the tales themselves we know can be dated to pre-Christian times uh, in the early Viking Age even. One comes in the poetic Edda poem Völuspo, where the wolf Fenrir is said to have a son, and this wolf is the one who will take a troll's form, a troll's hammer, and swallow the moon when it was Ragnarok, our apocalypse. Another uh, mention of troll comes in the prose Edda. Here it mentions how Thor was away in the far east fighting trolls, like you can see. Another source, um, they're also quite reliable. It comes from the uh, Prose Edda section, Skaldskapamol, with a skald named Bragi, who we know that this guy actually lived. Um, he lived in the 800s. Um, and in this source, he is basically having a poetry kind of conversation with a woman, and that woman claims that she is a troll. Unfortunately, she ends the little conversation with a rhetorical question, uh, saying basically, 
exactly what is troll but that. So it really doesn't give us any clues as to what a troll is. But we do know that uh, a very real person, uh, Bergi here, could communicate with this troll. And it was potentially both a troll and a real human woman, like a witch or a seeress. And this is usually what we are going to find in the Norse uh, sagas as well. The sagas are generally uh, pretty reliable and mostly based on real humans and events, uh, at least more often than not. Uh, but these were written a few hundred years, like transitioning from the native Norse religion into Scandinavia becoming fully uh, Christian. Uh, but it often depicts events that happened much earlier in the Viking Age when the people were still fully pagan then. And in these sagas, there were things like troll maidens, troll wives as they were called, troll women, troll men, and they all referred to a uh, witch or a wizard type of thing. Um, usually in a negative way, but not always. We also have the Norse word uh, trollskapir, uh, basically just referring to magic. In the Gisla Saga Suresonnet, uh, Torgrim is recruited to perform a magic ritual in order to curse someone, and, and the trollskap is uh, referred to. We can also use it as an adjective. Um, in Vattensdala Saga, the witch Ljot um, and her eyes were said to be uh, pointed trollishly. You can see the word here. And she is showing her backside and casting a curse. And in another source, Eirbygja Saga, the undead, uh, basically Tuirolf, uh, his corpse is described as being um, very trollish to look like, like black and bloated like a bull. We even have animals being referred to like trolls. In the Eirbygja Saga, the bellowing, like the loud noise of a bull is referred to as a uh, troll-like noise or cry. Uh, in Jolf's saga Kraka, uh, an hog, an actual boar, was possessed by magic and referred to as a troll. But a very interesting one comes in Urvar Od saga. Here, Ugmundir um, learned witchcraft and illusions from the Finns, and he eventually did a pagan ritual in which they uh, basically worshipped him and transformed him into a troll so that he became unlike any other human being. And he said here that people should uh, rather call him a spirit than a human, even though he was still alive. Later on in the story, um, he admits too that he is inhuman, and he states that I would be dead if it were in my nature. So, what ritual this was exactly, we don't know, that turned him into a troll. But pretty clear that there is no mention of him dying, so he seems to be very much a living person in our world, but also um, uh, habitating in the spirit world where he would do his magic. Another example comes in Halda Saga, uh, where a man named Soli is described as a great troll when he was living and during life, but an even worse one uh, since he became dead. Uh, so not much info there given about how he was a troll in real life, but we think he was some sort of uh, magician, and he presumably uh, turned to practicing magic when he was already alive. Later on, when he died, his spirit becomes the undead in his burial mound and he guards his treasure hoard, which is very similar to the trolls living in the mounds or mountains from much later on in the folklore, which I will speak about in a minute. On to another source. Um, so most of these were bad, kind of negative magicians, but uh, this wasn't always that way. In the Eirbygja Saga, uh, Trullit is used to refer to just an average woman from a good family. Her name was Geiridir, and she was known for using her magic for good. In another source, uh, Borida Saga, uh, it is a tale about a completely average family, you know, and it speaks about their romantic relations. And Borida, uh, who was a half troll actually, and half giant, his son Gested uh, basically abandoned the ways of his pagan ancestors and converted to Christianity in the court of King Olav Tryggvason. So all these people we know were real people. Um, whether or not you want to believe in this saga or not, that is up to you. But he converts to Christianity and the night of his baptism... 
his father's spirit, uh, Boydadur, appears, um, basically telling Gestur that he has betrayed his pagan ancestors and then he kills him. So right here is the first part that we really um, find a conflict between trolls and the new coming Christian religion into Scandinavia. All these things that you saw in the movie, like the trolls being banished and sent to the mountains, having their families killed and their thrones taken, also the trolls being able to smell Christian blood, uh, this is something we find in the folk tales from much later on. But it all started here when kind of there was seeming to be some sort of conflict uh, between the Christians and the uh, old pagan ways. When Christianity came into Scandinavia, they basically made all pagan practices illegal and you could be put to death for doing some of these things. One of the laws that we find in, in actually quite a few different law codes that are all up here, it prohibits people from at vecchia tull up, to wake up the trolls. These laws, by the way, were not just around at the start of Christianity. The laws were written down from the 13th century sources, and they were in effect all the way up until the 1800s, some of them. You were still not allowed to go out and wake up trolls. So the religion uh, from pagan times did not just die out in the year 1000 when they officially became Christian. There were old practices being done in private and illegally uh, for a long, long time after that. One of these laws that is very interesting in relation to trolls is it prohibits people from practicing utiseta. Utiseta was basically sitting out directly translated where you would go out and sit out on a burial mound or a crossroads or a sacred space to wake up the spirits there to gain some sort of wisdom or power. This is why trolls are said to have lived in the mountains or hills or even burial mounds. These things are the most common places where all manner of spirits actually were said to reside in Scandinavian uh, folklore. The ancestral spirits, the elves, the land spirits, the haugbui, and of course, trolls. Although we definitely don't have any sources that give us a clear indication of what uh, these spirits were and where they were living exactly, because they kind of lost the understanding of these different spirits. And when we get into more recent times, during the past few hundred years, trolls are definitely the ones referred to more than anything else. Now, there are dozens and dozens of mentions of trolls in the folklore from tales all over Scandinavia, and there are way too many to go over here. Um, and the truth is that trolls in the folk tales come in so many different shapes, sizes, and have many different functions. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they are evil, and sometimes they are just kind of neutral and mischievous. Uh, but from what it seems, it definitely appears as though the understanding of trolls had faded away from the Middle Ages until the times where these folk tales are from, like I said, from the 16, 17, 1800s. And, you know, the spirits that they maybe understood trolls to be in the old time, or potentially even human beings, uh, that kind of lost its meaning and they were all referred to as trolls. But the original, what a troll originally was, going back to the uh, late Middle Ages and the Viking Age, a troll was more defined by its function, actually, than what race or species it belonged to. It could be humans, it could be spirits, it could be animals, all these things could be referred to as trolls in the oldest uh, mentions we have of it. But later on in time, trolls were definitely a separate species uh, to humans, uh, possibly used to refer to a variety of different types of spirits, and people had simply just lost the understanding of what all these were and what they do, and they just referred to them all as trolls. Among other spirits, too, though, uh, there are ones that come up a lot in the folk tradition, such as the Nisse or Tumte or Vardöget or other ones like that, but you'll really have to read these tales if you want to know the difference between trolls and all those things. But I will conclude with a couple good points relating to the movie, actually. Uh, in Iceland, uh, a troll kind of developed into being a specific race of mountain-dwelling, giant, ogre-type things. Uh, whereas in the rest of the Nordic countries, um, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, 
trolls kind of shrunk in size and trolls became these mystical little creatures usually more associated with the spirit world and living in the mountains although we do find some big ones too in the Norwegian tradition living in the mountains. Um, the troll movie was set in Norway of course uh, in uh, Dovrefjell uh, so it only makes sense that the biggest mountain holds the biggest troll uh, but the actual troll in there, this giant kind of stone-like creature that's big as a mountain, this is actually more of an Icelandic conception of a troll. But everything else about the movie and trolls is spot on. The living in the mountains are hills. Of course, Dovrefjell being the largest mountain, the largest troll is living there. And the last remaining one, actually, you know, he's being the king of the trolls and the family of the troll killed and his old kingdom taken from him and the smelling of the blood of Christians and, of course, turning into stone at sunlight because traditionally the old pagan practice of waking up trolls, that would be done by sitting out on a mound at night. And then when the daylight came, the spirits would go back into the mound or mountain. Uh, sometimes even taking humans with them, as we read about in these folk tales. But uh, that's all for today. Hope that helps. There are lots of great books about this if you guys want to learn more. But for now, I will turn it back to Andre. Tusen takk, og vi ses neste gang. Tusen takk, Tord. Most of that was new, even to me. What about all of you guys watching? Did any of this come as a surprise to you? And what did you think about the movie? Let us know in the comments, and then head on over to Norse Magic and Beliefs for more scholar deep dives into all things Norse. You might want to begin with his video on the difference between the Norwegian, Danish and Swedish Vikings, and I promise you won't want to stop there. Before you go, please smash that like, help share this video, and subscribe if you haven't done so already.